So this afternoon I'd like to follow on from uh, Rebecca's talk talking about winter chill and start talking a bit about bud burst and flowering. And I'd like to talk about some of the approaches that we're using to research an extension or to research an extension towards gaining a better understanding of bud burst and flowering in a changing climate. And we're undertaking this work as part of a national collaborative industry funded program into climate change. So we know that historically Australia's climate has warmed since 1910 and we, it's likely to continue warming. What we don't understand is what the potential impacts of this change in growing climate might be on the way that we grow apples and pears in this country. It's important that we understand the potential impacts for the industry because it determines how the industry might adapt. And the early implementation of appropriate adaptation strategies is really important in reducing the vulnerability of the industry to climate change in the longer term. So one aim of this project is to look at how bud burst, dormancy, dormancy progression, bud burst and flowering may respond to climate change. And it's important we're looking at these developmental phases because they are integral to the production of high marketable yields and they are particularly vulnerable to changes in temperature. So how might a warmer climate impact on bud burst and flowering? It might impact on the timing, making bud burst and flowering earlier or later. It might, if warmer climates lead to reduced winter chill, it might lead to more variable uneven flowering and a longer duration of the flowering period. So how might these changes in flowering impact on orchard management practices and profitability? Obviously, if there are changes in the timing of flowering, this may result in the loss of synchronisation in flowering between a variety and its pollinizer, which can result in reductions in fruit set. More insecticide sprays might be required, required during a longer duration of a flowering period, and it might make the timing of chemical thinner application more difficult. We, it may also result in a greater variability of fruit maturity at harvest, which can cause a more difficult and labour intensive pick. So how can we gain a better understanding of these potential impacts? Through the use of research, extension and communication. And firstly, I'd like to talk about some of the approaches that we're taking to research in this project. So if we want to think about how something might change in the future, we firstly need to gather together some really good information and some data to create a picture of what it looks like now. So for this project to understand how bud burst and flowering might change in response to future climates, we first need to understand that complex relationship that exists between bud burst and flowering and temperature in the current climate. So for this project, we're interested in understanding how the temperatures that are received in an orchard during, before, during and after dormancy relate to the timing and quality of bud burst and flowering. So what is it that we're actually doing? We're collecting a series of detailed data on temperature, bud burst and flowering dates from four climatically distinct locations around Australia. Applethorpe in Queensland, Hewenville in Tasmania, Shepparton in Victoria and Manjimup over in Western Australia. So I'd first just like to look briefly at the different climates of each of these locations so that you can keep this in mind as we go through some of the bud burst and flowering data. So this here is simply a graph of the mean monthly temperature that's received at each, the, each of these locations throughout the year. And what you can see is you might expect that the temperatures in all of the locations start to fall around autumn. Manjim up here in the red has a milder winter than the other locations. Applethorpe here in the blue has a more a milder spring or a warmer spring. And Hewen, as you might expect, is cooler all year round. So keeping these differences in temperature at those different locations in mind, what does the bud burst and flowering look like under these different climates of these regions? So this is a graph here of the bud burst and full bloom dates in Pink Lady for 2014. In Hewen, Manjimup, Applethorpe and Shepparton. So what we can see was that in 2014 in Pink Lady, Shepparton reached bud burst 
earliest on, I think it's about the 1st of September there, followed by Applethorpe, Manjimup, and then Hewen last on about the 17th of September. If we then have a look at the full bloom dates, we can see that Shepparton reached full bloom first, followed by Applethorpe, Hewen, and then Manjimup on about the 18th of October. It's also interesting if we have a look at the time between green tip and full bloom, and what we can see is that in Hewen, Applethorpe and Shepparton, it takes about 27 to, or it did it this in this case, took about 27 to 28 days to go from that green tip to full bloom date. And that's in comparison to Manjimup, where it took about 36 days to get from that green tip to full bloom date. So to investigate this a little bit further, I want to have a look at the, uh, the progression of flowering in Pink Lady at each of those locations for 2014. So this here is a graph that shows the percentage of open flowers here on the left and the dates along the bottom. And what we can see is that we've got Shepparton here in green, uh, Applethorpe here in blue, and Hewen here in purple, all showing a very similar pattern of flowering. Whereas Manjimup shows quite a different pattern of flowering with a more uneven and pr protracted period of flowering there. It's also interesting to have a look up here at the first flower dates, here with the dots, and we can see that the time between the first flower <coughs> and full bloom in Manjimup is more than twice as long as the time between the first flower and full bloom at the other three locations. So clearly Manjimup is showing a more protracted duration and more uneven duration of flowering period compared to the other three locations used in this study. Okay, so we've had a look at how bud burst and flowering might vary between sites in the one year, but it's also interesting to have a look at how bud burst and flowering might vary at the one location between different years. So this graph shows the bud burst and full bloom dates in Pink Lady for Applethorpe in Queensland in 2012, 2013 and 2014. And in brackets here, I've got the amount of chill portions that were received in each of those years. And what's quite interesting is there is quite a bit of variability, as you might expect from your own experience, in the bud burst and flowering dates between years. So in 2013, green tip was about nine days later than it was, sorry, in 2014, it was about nine days later than in 2013. The full bloom date was about 14 days later than what was experienced in 2013. So clearly there's quite a bit of variability there in the dates, even though the chill portions that re were received in each of those years are not very different. So to summarise those research findings to date, after the analysis of the three years of bud burst and flowering data that we've collected so far, we still have one more year of data to collect, we found that those differences that we see in the pattern of winter chill at each of those locations are associated with variability in the timing and pattern of bud burst and flowering, as you might expect. We found that in Manjimup, there was clearly a more protracted and variable pattern of flowering at that location compared to the other sites. And we've also found that there are obvious seasonal differences in bud burst and flowering date uh, at the one location from year to year. So what's really interesting now for this project is to collect and to have a look at all of this data that we've got and to try and determine what it is that's actually driving this variability that we see in bud burst and flowering because it's that knowledge that will really help us understand how bud burst and flowering might change under future climates and how we might potentially manage it. So briefly now, I'd just like to touch on some of the approaches that we're using to extension and communication within this work. And the reason I'm interested in having a bit of a talk about this part of the project is because I think that communication for growers and industry in the area of climate change is really important for a number of reasons. Firstly, because I think it's really important that we are able to improve industry knowledge of climate issues. Obviously, out in the media, there's an enormous amount of information and misinformation out there relating to climate change and climate issues. And I think it's really important for this project and this program 
to be able to pick out the bits of information that are really relevant for the apple and pear industry. I think it's really important that we access and we get feedback from growers, as Rebecca talked about in her talk. All of the observations that I've talked about in the work that we're doing as part of this project, observations of temperature, bud burst and flowering dates, are all observations that growers take in their own orchards and have been doing many for many years. And so there's a wealth of information and knowledge that's been gained out there that we really want to make sure that we're able to tap into. And thirdly, because we want to gain a better understanding of climate adaptation. So every grower growing in different parts of Australia is going to face slightly different climate challenges and they're going to adapt to those climate challenges in slightly different ways. And so I think it's really important that we're able to capture those differences and those adaptations for the whole of the Australian industry. So how are we going about this, re this uh, extension and communication? Through the holding of, of meetings and workshops, throughout Australia, publications and websites uh, the, on the HIN website, the APAL website, and also through the publication of a number of grower publications which will come out and be available in 2016, specifically on climate and the apple and pear industry. And finally, through the use of grower surveys. And I just would like to highlight that during the lunch break, we put out a whole lot of these surveys on people's seats and I'd like to invite you, it's, it's all about winter chill and flowering, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to fill in those surveys if you feel that you have a particular interest in doing so and um, place them in this box here on your way out of the room, which I'll put out the door there. We also have a stand in the trade show hall, uh, I think it's stand number 86, Jen, and uh, we're really interested in getting growers or people involved in the broader industry along to have a bit of a chat to us about any issues to do with what we've talked about today or more broadly about climate issues. And finally, the wonderful research team and organisations that are behind all of this work. So thank you, Angus.